a previous discussion, we have seen that classifiers whose decision boundaries pass very close to the data points are less confident about their predictions and can be quite brittle. See the link above to revisit that discussion. This toy example from our previous discussion shows how Melbo's classifier starts giving wrong predictions if the points are shifted even a little bit, since Melbo's decision boundary passes very close to the data points. On the other hand, Melby's classifier is much more robust. Can we somehow ensure that the classifier we learn is indeed robust and makes confident predictions? Today, we will see how to do just that. My wonderful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Suppose we are given binary classification data in the form of yellow and purple colored points. If our only goal is to learn a linear classifier that perfectly classifies all the points, that is, keeps all the yellow points on one side and the purple points on the other side, then we find that there are infinitely many such classifiers. Of course, some of the classifiers make confident predictions as they stay away from any of the purple or yellow points, whereas others make brittle predictions since they pass very close to some of the points. However, each one of them offers perfect classification. In such a situation, we are said to have an ill-posed problem on our hands. You would have come across ill-posed problems in high school mathematics when you studied systems of linear equations that have infinitely many solutions. Whenever we encounter an ill-posed problem in machine learning, it usually means that our data is insufficient or deficient in some way. Thankfully, ill-posed problems can be made well-posed by imposing additional demands on the solution we seek. Suppose for the exact same data set, we now seek to learn not just any classifier that perfectly classifies all the data points, but one that makes confident predictions on all data points. Recall from our previous discussion that the level of confidence of the prediction made by a classifier on a data point can be measured by calculating the distance of that data point from the decision boundary of the classifier. This quantity is formally called the geometric margin and a large geometric margin means a more confident prediction. Note that we want our classifier to have a large margin on every data point. A classifier that has small margin on certain data points will not do. It turns out that the problem of finding a large margin classifier is a well-posed one since there is a unique classifier that maximizes the geometric margin on all data points. A proof that this solution is indeed unique involves concepts such as strong convexity and is beyond the scope of our discussion, but we will nevertheless be able to learn how to learn such large margin classifiers in today's discussion. Finding this large margin classifier requires us to use tools from the area of optimization. Optimization is a branch of mathematics that deals with algorithms that can find the best object with certain properties. The object could be a vector or a scalar or a combination of vectors and scalars. For example, in our application, the object we will be searching for are the parameters of a linear model given by a vector w and a scalar b. The properties these objects must satisfy are called constraints and we usually have a rating function of sorts to help us decide the best object. This rating function is formally called the objective function. Let us take a toy example to illustrate this. Suppose we wish to find the smallest value of the function x square in the interval 3 to 6. Then we can set up an optimization problem to encode our requirements as shown here. We use one constraint to demand that our mystery number be smaller than 6. We use another constraint to demand that the number be larger than 3. And we use x square as the objective function. It is easy to see that the solution to this optimization problem is in number 3. The set of objects that satisfy all the constraints is called the feasible set of the optimization problem. For our toy example, the feasible set is a set of all numbers that are simultaneously smaller than 6 and larger than 3, which is nothing but the interval 3 to 6. Note that there may exist optimization problems that have no solution since their feasible set is empty. 
no object simultaneously satisfies all the constraints in such situations. This would be similar to a set of linear equations that are conflicting with each other and have no solution. To search for a large margin classifier, we similarly set up an optimization problem. We are given data points with feature vectors that are d-dimensional and binary labels that are either plus one or minus one. We wish to learn a linear classifier parameterized by the vector w and the scalar bias term b such that the classification is given by the sign of w transpose x plus b. We wish to learn a classifier that classifies all the points correctly but also has large margin on all points. That is, the decision boundary is far from all the points. Recall that in a previous discussion, we calculated that the distance of a point x from a hyperplane given by w and b is simply the absolute value of w transpose x plus b divided by the Euclidean norm of the vector w. Thus, the constraints for this optimization problem are that the classifier must predict each label correctly. Note that this happens exactly when the sign of w transpose xi plus b is the same as yi, which in turn happens exactly when the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b is positive. Our objective function for this optimization problem is the smallest geometric margin on any point since we want every single data point to have large margin. However, note that this optimization problem will have an empty feasible set and fail to have a solution if no linear classifier can correctly classify all the points. One simple example is this famous XOR arrangement where yellow and purple points are arranged in opposite diagonals of a square. Try to draw a line separating the yellow points from the purple ones. You will find that no such line exists. We will deal with such non-separable cases later. The objective function in the optimization problem we just set up is a bit complicated. Let us try to simplify it a bit. First of all, we notice that if a classifier correctly predicts a data point, then the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b is positive. But note that this product can be made greater than 1, not just greater than 0, simply by scaling w and b. It is notable that the scale classifier makes the exact same predictions and has the exact same margin on every data point. This rescaling may seem unnecessary right now, but we will soon find out that this greatly simplifies the optimization problem we are trying to solve. In fact, the simplification will yield the famous support vector machine classifier. We start with the original optimization problem, just that we now search over rescale classifiers for which the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b is greater than or equal to 1 for every point. We now notice that this means that the smallest geometric margin on any data point is just the inverse of the Euclidean norm of w, which is a huge simplification. Making some simple manipulations on the objective function leaves the optimization problem unchanged, yielding the SVM optimization problem. The reason behind this funny name support vector machine is a topic of discussion for another day. It turns out that handling non-separable cases where no linear classifier can perfectly classify all the points is very simple. Note that if a data point gets misclassified, then the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b would not be greater than 1 for that point. In fact, the product would be negative. However, we do not know in advance which points will get misclassified, so we cannot change the constraints for just those points. A cool workaround to this problem uses the concept of slack variables. We introduce a new variable xi for every data point and demand that the product yi times w transpose xi plus b be greater than 1 minus xi. If a point is misclassified, say yi into w transpose xi plus b is equal to minus 1, then the new constraint can still be satisfied by setting xi to a large value for that point, specifically xi equal to 2 in this case. For points that are correctly classified with a large margin, which is the points for which the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b is already greater than 1, we simply set xi to be 0, that is, no slack is required. For points that are correctly classified, but with small margin, say the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b is 0.2, we need to set xi to a small value between 0 and 1 for those points. 
Specifically, we need to set xi equal to 0.8 in this case. However, introducing these slack variables may cause more problems than they solve if we are not careful. And the optimization problem may yield trivial solutions. Thus, we must penalize the optimization problem whenever it sets a xi variable to a non-zero value to prevent its misuse. The CSVM formulation does just this by forcing the xi values to always take a non-negative value and charging a cost of c times xi whenever a xi value is set to a value greater than zero. Here, c is a hyperparameter that is set manually to some non-negative value, say c equal to 1 or c equal to 10, etc. Naturally, the larger the value of the c, the more aggressively we penalize the use of slack variables. However, note that setting c to very large values, say c equal to 1000, increases the difficulty of the optimization problem and the solvers we use, say in the scikit-learn library, may take a long time to solve that problem. However, setting c to extremely small values may also yield nonsensical solutions, as you will show in this exercise where we have the CSVM problem but with the value of c set to 0. Solve this optimization problem and observe the pitfalls of setting c to a vanishingly small value. You might find the properties of the Euclidean norm helpful in solving this problem. You might also be surprised to discover that the solution to this optimization problem does not depend on how many data points we have or whether the data is linearly separable or not. Slack variables also allow us to rewrite the CSVM problem much more neatly. Recall that for data points where the classifier already gives us a healthy margin, we can set the slack to zero. We can use this to deduce that the exact amount of slack required for any data point is simply the positive part of the quantity 1 minus the product of yi and w transpose xi plus b. Note that we have used here the positive part function that looks a lot like an inverted ReLU function. The positive part function is identity on the positive half of the real line and zero on the negative half of the real line. Using this, we can rewrite the CSVM problem with only an objective function and no constraints at all. Such optimization problems are called unconstrained optimization problems. Note that this new objective function has two parts. One that encourages the Euclidean norm of W to be small and the other one that looks a lot like a loss function. In fact, this is nothing but the famous hinge loss function. The hinge loss function gives model parameters a zero loss value if they make a correct classification on a data point with sufficient margin. A small loss value is given if the classification is correct but with insufficient margin and a large loss value is given for incorrect classification on a data point. So today, we learned that ML models are often learned by solving optimization problems. There are two main ingredients of an optimization problem, the constraints and the objective function. Some optimization problems maximize their objective functions, whereas others minimize their objective functions. We also saw that ill-posed problems may have infinitely many solutions and an optimization problem may actually fail to have any solution if its feasible set is empty. Certain optimization problems may have no constraints. These are called unconstrained optimization problems. For example, the CSVM problem with the hinge loss formulation has no constraints at all. There are several techniques to solve the optimization problems which we will learn in our future discussions, as well as we will discover why the SVM model has such a funny name. But that's a topic for another day. For today, this is a good point to stop. Have a blast and I'll catch up with you in the next one.